a reading from the Acts of the Apostles. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the upper country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples. He said, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? He said, they said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with a baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one that was to come after him, Jesus. And on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came down upon them. They spoke in tongues and they prophesied. There were about 12 of them in all. I remember when I was a youth minister in St. Louis, Missouri, we had a diocesan-wide renewal, and the program was called Renew. And it boiled down to small group gatherings, and one time we were in a small group gathering. I'd say maybe we had about 10 people there, and I was the leader because I was the youth minister. So the 10 of us were gathered around, and I was talking about the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit had changed and touched my life. And I'll never forget, there was a woman sitting across from me. She looked at me and she said, Cedric, who is this Holy Spirit? And how come we never hear about this at Mass? And I looked at her and I saw such hunger. I saw such a desire. I believe that that woman with her question, who is the Holy Spirit and how come we don't hear about this? I believe she was representing millions of people in the Catholic Church and in Christendom at large who want to know about the Holy Spirit. And she was hungry and saying, how come we don't hear about this? Just recently, I was talking to a woman. She came up to me and she said, Father, I feel stuck in my prayer life. I feel stuck in my spiritual life. And I said, well, pray to the Holy Spirit. And she looked at me with a big smile and she said, I want to know about the Holy Spirit. And so many people around the world are hungry and thirsty for the Holy Spirit. I love what happened here in the reading that I was just talking and I just proclaim to you, Paul comes to Ephesus. Ephesus, of course, this large Roman colony. I've been there when I studied the Bible over in Israel and Greece and Turkey. And it's a large Roman colony with thousands and thousands of people. Well, there were some believers there. Apparently, Apollos had been there, proclaimed the gospel. But it wasn't the full gospel. Because when Paul came to them, he said, have you received the Holy Spirit? Now, why would he ask a question like that? Because I believe that perhaps when they were worshiping, they didn't have any joy. Perhaps in their service, they didn't give much money. You see, the, the Spirit inspires joy and generosity and peace and uh, love. And so Paul looked at them and said, did you receive the Holy Spirit? And they said, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So he laid hands on them, they received the Holy Spirit, and as we heard, they prophesied, they spoke in tongues. In other words, they were revolutionized by the Holy Spirit. Now, as Catholics, we've heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So unlike the Ephesians, at least we've heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Let me explain that. But unfortunately, and I've traveled the United States preaching about the Holy Spirit, for unfortunately, for many people, even though they've heard that there is a Holy Spirit, they have no relationship with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is distant and unknown. And that's why in this series, I want to help you to receive the Holy Spirit. I believe that as you're watching these programs, you can be filled with the same Spirit that touched those Ephesians. As you're watching this whole series that will be coming, that you can receive the Holy Spirit. Peter one time was preaching to Gentiles, Cornelius, who was a centurion, and his family. And just as, they was, just as they were listening to the word, it says in the scriptures, the Spirit fell upon them. So I believe that the Spirit will fall upon you as you're watching this series. And that's my heart's desire. I believe one of the reasons, one of the main reasons that God called me to become a Catholic priest is to proclaim the Holy Spirit that has so revolutionized my life. So we have heard that there is a Holy Spirit. For example, if you go to St. Peter's at the Vatican, first thing you're going to see as you're worshiping at Mass, if you look up above Bernini's columns, you will see this 
big, uh, I believe it's alabaster window of this dove with rays coming out of the dove. That's representative of, symbolic of the Holy Spirit who at every Mass works in a powerful way. We begin Mass by praying in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So Mass is an action, a movement, if you will, of the Holy Spirit. Every Mass is begun in the name of the Holy Spirit. And then at Mass, all kinds of beautiful things will happen. I, I know that at Mass, it's a movement of the Holy Spirit and the greeting, for example, the priest will say the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and get this, in the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. That word, by the way, was changed a few years ago in the new missal from fellowship with the Holy Spirit to communion. And I like the word communion better because communion, of course, implies uh, unity, uh, a oneness, uh, something intimate. And I'm going like that because there's a communion. <laughs> communion at Mass, of course, when you receive the body and blood of Jesus, comes right into us. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. There's a tremendous communion in the Holy Spirit. And this is exactly what Jesus taught us to pray for. The Gospel of Luke has been termed the Gospel of the Holy Spirit because he has the theme of the Holy Spirit runs throughout his Gospel. His second work was the Acts of the Apostles. Acts of the Apostles, as some, by some scholars, has been called the Acts of the Holy Spirit because really, although the Apostles were evangelizing and going throughout the world proclaiming the Gospel, it's the Holy Spirit working through them that does the evangelization. So, in the Gospel of Luke, which is the Gospel of the Holy Spirit, as I said, we see Jesus telling us, if you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? And that's what I want you to be doing during this series. Ask for an anointing. Ask for communion. Ask for a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit. This will revolutionize your life. This has transformed me and changed me and millions of others. And I know it will touch you too. I want you to be filled with the Holy Spirit and touched by the Holy Spirit. Have communion with the Holy Spirit. I remember as a young man, I prayed specifically for a deeper relationship with God and God answered that prayer. I was not even an altar boy growing up, although I grew up Catholic. And now, to date, I've been a priest for 27 years, 28 years soon. I've written many books and produced for television and travel around the United States preaching missions, all so that people can have a deeper relationship with God. It's real simple. We fell away from God at the fall of humanity Garden of Eden, as you heard, there was a separation. And now what the gospel is all about is bringing us back into communion with God. It's not complicated. It's very simple. This is why Jesus came. He said, I have come that you may have life and life abundant. So I want you to receive this abundance, this new life, this new life of the Holy Spirit, the grace of the Holy Spirit, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So we hear about it at Mass, and also at Mass, besides the greeting, we have what's called the Epiclesis prayer. And the Epiclesis prayer happens during uh, the presentation of the gifts, the, the, the bread and the wine, and what happens is the priest will begin to pray over these gifts. This is called the Epiclesis which means the calling down of the Holy Spirit upon the gifts. And we ask the Spirit to come down upon the gifts like the dew fall, so that they may become the very body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the Spirit comes upon, it's a miracle, it's called the miracle of transubstantiation, where bread and wine through the Spirit, through the Holy Spirit, actually are changed and transformed into the body and the blood of Christ. The number one reason the Spirit comes is to bring us communion, to bring us oneness, to bring us an intimate, uh, intense, personal relationship with God. Number two, 
The reason why the Spirit comes upon us is to transform us. Just as the Spirit comes upon bread and wine and transforms them into the body and the blood of Christ, the Spirit comes upon us to transform us. Remember the story of the transfiguration. Jesus on the mountaintop with the disciples, and as he's there, there's this wonderful transfiguration. His face changes, and it all happened by the glory of God, by the Spirit of God. In the same way, the Spirit wants to transfigure us, transform us. Notice the term, the Holy Spirit. What the Holy Spirit wants to do in us is to help us to resist sin, resist temptation, and acquire virtue to become holy. And that's the role of the Holy Spirit in our life. Number one, bringing us a deep relationship with God, communion. But number two, to transform us, to make us holy. So my point is, is that we have heard about the Holy Spirit at Mass in many different ways. Just the introduction making the sign of the cross, the greeting. And then at Mass, at the Epiclesis, we ask the Spirit to come upon the gifts. And then at the Creed, we profess that we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and the giver of life. So this is, these are all parts of the Mass that are identifying and proclaiming the Holy Spirit. So at the Creed, we're proclaiming that the Holy Spirit is the Lord and the giver of life. Let's stop right there for a second. The Spirit of God is Lord. In other words, some people think the Holy Spirit is kind of this new age angel or cloud or mist just kind of out there somewhere. Let's get this clear. The Holy Spirit is God the third person of the Blessed Trinity, Lord and giver of life. So make no mistake about it. The Spirit is God living in you right now. And then giver of life. You didn't just happen to be, you weren't a mistake. You didn't just come to be by the decision of your parents. This is right from the first chapter of the Gospel of John. Rather, we are born of the Spirit. It's the Spirit of God who knit us together in our mother's womb. So the Spirit is God and giver of life. The Spirit has brought life to you. And I want you to understand that the Spirit not only gave you life in your mother's womb, but brings new life, something refreshing, something revolutionizing, something transformative life-changing. Let's look at some of the saints really quickly. I remember St. Vincent Pallotti, a great saint in the church, but he was a struggling student growing up. And his mother told him, he, because he was struggling at class, told him to pray to the Holy Spirit. Now we're talking about how the Holy Spirit brings life. She said, pray to the Holy Spirit for help. So he prayed a novena. And by the way, the first novena, that means nine novena, the first novena in the Catholic Church was the novena and is the novena to the Holy Spirit, where we pray for the gifts of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, communion with the Spirit, transformation by the Spirit. So Vincent Pallotti prayed a novena to the Holy Spirit, and he asked for illumination, for help in his studies. After he prayed that novena, he actually became a star student. You see, the Spirit brings illumination, wisdom, knowledge, understanding, counsel. We're talking about how the Spirit brings life. Not only did the Spirit give you life, but brings new life to us. Think about the knowledge and the understanding about what is to come, about heaven, about who God is, about your life and its purpose and its passion. Wow! Pray to the Holy Spirit for understanding. I marvel at some of the saints in our church. For example, St. Catherine of Siena, one of my favorite saints, she had very little education, yet she became a saint in the church, not only a saint, but a doctor of the church, one of four women to become a doctor in the church. That, 
Very few people in the history of our Catholic Church have ever become doctors, and she's got hardly any education. How did that happen? How did she receive this mystical marriage from God? How did she have all those dialogues with God? If you've ever read anything about St. Catherine of Siena, the Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit brings new life. Didn't just give us life, but refreshing illumination. The Spirit is light and life. And in addition to St. Vincent Pallotti, I think about some of the other saints, the Cure de Ars, for example, St. John Vianney. He loved the Holy Spirit. And in the confessional, you know that he heard many, many confessions. He was able to read people's minds and to see their soul. And he did that through the Holy Spirit living in him. He loved the Holy Spirit. He gave an example one time about the Holy Spirit. He said, in one hand, you have a sponge full of water Another hand, you have a little pebble in your hand and you squeeze both. And he said the, the pebble, the little pebble in that hand, when you squeeze it, nothing comes out of it. Those are like people with a hard heart that haven't received the Holy Spirit. That's what he said. But he said, when you squeeze that sponge full of water, an abundance of water comes forth, sopping wet, dripping. He said, those are people who have received the Holy Spirit. There's an abundance. There's a lavish grace. Think about knowing God's love. Think about joy. Think about the peace that surpasses all understanding, dripping wet with the anointing of God. You see, the Spirit brings life. And not just the life that everybody has, but the Spirit does that. That's where it all begins at conception. But the Spirit brings something new, love, and peace, joy, knowledge, counsel, wisdom, illumination, the wonderful gifts and the fruit of the Spirit. And the Spirit brings transformation, the power to resist sin, to overcome temptation, and to be virtuous. I love what it says in the scriptures. It's not by power, or, nor by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. In other words, as you go through light, life, it's not grit, it's grace. It's not resolution, but revolution. We need transformation, and the spirit brings such grace and such wonders and such new life. So we have heard about the Holy Spirit. It happens all the time at Mass. I've already given you a couple of examples. And the Catholic Church has a prayer from a long time ago. It's called Veni Sancte Spiritus, ancient tradition prayer of the church. Veni Sancte Spiritus means come Holy Spirit. Well, what I want to say is not only come Holy Spirit, but welcome Holy Spirit. <laughs> because if you know anything theologically, the Spirit doesn't just come down upon us. The Spirit is omnipresent. So in other words, the Spirit is already present with us. So what we need to do is not ask the Spirit to come down upon us, but to welcome the Holy Spirit that's already there. Paul the Apostle said, you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. The word means a shrine of the Holy Spirit. So in other words, he was telling his Corinthian community, don't you know? Don't you know that you're the temple? Don't you know that the Spirit lives within you? So your role is to welcome the Holy Spirit into the depths of your heart. Not just a one-time prayer. Remember what Jesus said? If you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? So in other words, Jesus was telling us, keep asking, keep welcoming, keep seeking the Holy Spirit. I always conclude my parish missions when I'm on the road. You know, I go to churches all around the country and preach about Jesus and a relationship with him, the meaning of suffering, about prayer, about being positive, all these different, different topics. And I want to always conclude with a Mass of the Holy Spirit. And usually at that Mass is I give a witness and we call the Spirit uh, down upon the people and we open up the hearts of people to have an awakening. And by the way, an awakening is what the 12-step program is all about. That's why I really enjoy the 12-step program and preaching about it. 
because it was founded so that people would have a spiritual awakening. That's exactly what I want to happen at my parish missions and my TV programs and my books. I want people to have an awakening with God, a new consciousness with God. Well, what happens is during the Mass, people receive the Holy Spirit in a powerful way as I, I preach, as we celebrate. And I really sense that, that people are uh, invigorated and their relationship with God is intensified. But then something starts to happen. I believe that after the mission, it wanes because they kind of, they don't continue to pray and they don't continue to seek the Holy Spirit in a tangible, specific way. So during this series, I'm praying that you will be drenched, kind of like that soaking sponge abundantly with the Holy Spirit so that you will continue to seek the Spirit and it won't wane for you. You must specifically and intentionally seek the Spirit. So at Mass, we hear all about the Holy Spirit. And I remember it was John Paul, now St. John Paul II, 1986. He promulgated an encyclical about the Holy Spirit. The encyclical was called Lord and Giver of Life, right from the Creed. Remember, the Holy Spirit is God and gives us life in our mother's womb, but new life the fruit, the gifts, power, strength, the ability to overcome temptation, to come into sobriety if you're in the 12-step program. That's the higher power that we're talking about. It's the Holy Spirit. Anyway, 1986, John Paul II writes this encyclical, and he said, faith in the Holy Spirit needs to be reawakened and deepened in the consciousness of the people of God. I so agree with that. That is exactly why I became a Catholic priest, because we need to have this awakening. I've already talked about that. That's exactly what happens in the 12-step program. That's what needs to happen in our worship, in our prayers, in our reading, in Catholicism in general. There needs to be an awakening, a new consciousness of the Holy Spirit. And then he said, the Second Vatican Council must be succeeded by a new study and devotion to the Holy Spirit. I love that. The Spirit was talked about at the Second Vatican Council, but he said there needs to be a study, a devotion to the Holy Spirit. And I believe further than that, deeper than that, he was talking about people, our church, and the, the soul of the church is the, the Holy Spirit. Our church needs to have a personal encounter with the Holy Spirit, an awakening, not just a study and a devotion, as important as that is. There needs to be experiences of the Holy Spirit, much like what happened to the Ephesians at Ephesus. When Paul laid hands on them, all of a sudden, they started uh, having this new awareness of the Holy Spirit, and their lives were revolutionized. I don't think it's a coincidence that after Vatican II, Vatican II ended about 1966 or so, but really it was a new beginning for the church in many ways. I don't think it's a coincidence. 1967, a group of college students were at Duquesne University, and they're on a retreat. They're in the chapel. Nothing was happening during the retreat. So one of the students writes on a chalkboard, we need a miracle. <laughs> well, as they're praying, all of a sudden, they were all touched by the Holy Spirit in a powerful way that changed their lives, not only as students, but as young people, and brought them into a personal relationship with Jesus. This was, we can trace it, this was the traditional beginning of the charismatic renewal in the Catholic Church. Millions of people since 1967 have encountered the Holy Spirit in powerful ways. Now, I share this with you simply trying to tell you that the Catholic Church has had a great tradition of the Holy Spirit, and even recently with the charismatic renewal. But I in no way am, I'm, I am not trying to make people charismatic. That's not what I'm about here. You see, I believe that the Holy Spirit is beyond the charismatic renewal. It's for all people. It's for every Catholic, every Christian should encounter the Holy Spirit in a deep personal way. I'm not trying to make you charismatic. 
I am trying to get you to receive the Holy Spirit. If you want to be charismatic and express your faith that way, more power to you. But I believe that the Spirit ought to be normative for all Catholics. I think about Mother Angelica, for example, foundress of EWTN. Contemplative nun. Love the Lord. Cloistered. Prayerful. Well, she met this priest, Father de Grandis. And by the way, this comes from the book written by Raymond Arroyo, the book about Mother Angelica. And he had a chapter where he wrote, and it was called The Spirit Moves. She meets this priest, Father de Grandis, and he wanted to pray over Mother for an anointing of the Holy Spirit. And she replied, I got the Holy Spirit at confirmation. And he said, yes, Mother, you did. But I want there to be an awakening, something more. Finally, he did pray over her. And she didn't feel anything right away, much like many of us at our confirmation. We don't feel anything. And right after he prayed over her, she said, is, is that it? And that's what we do at confirmation. That's what I did at confirmation. Is that it? Nothing seems to have happened. Well, about a week later, she's reading the scriptures. And the scriptures came alive for her in a way that it hadn't before. She began to teach the scriptures in her own beautiful style that made people be able to laugh and relate to the scriptures. And then she began to record her talks on cassette tapes. Soon she got into radio. And after that, she began recording for television. You see, when she received this anointing of the Holy Spirit, things started to change and it became eventually the founding of EWTN. EWTN today, I believe, is a move of the Holy Spirit around the world. Wow. So the Spirit is normative for the Catholic Church. The Spirit is the soul of the Catholic Church. And I am praying, as you watch this program right now, just like what happened to the Gentile Cornelius and his family, the Spirit will fall upon you. Your responsibility is to pray specifically for the Holy Spirit, pray for this wonderful anointing, and don't let it wane. Don't give up. Day after day after day, say, come Holy Spirit. Welcome Holy Spirit. Read books about the Holy Spirit. Pray a novena to the Holy Spirit, especially right before Pentecost, and continue to watch these programs about the Holy Spirit. And I'm praying that your life will be transformed and revolutionized by the Lord and the giver of life that is the Holy Spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Write us at Father Cedric Ministries, 430 Bunker Hill Road, Houston, Texas, 77024, or log on to www.fathercedric.org. Simply call 844-FATHER-C. That's 844-328-4372.